Now it's time to show you uh, this graph that I really like. It's called binding energy per nucleon. Of course, we have another science cat here. How often do you like jokes about elements periodically? Uh -huh. uh, because here we're going to talk about actually nucleosynthesis. And this has a lot to do with astrophysics. That's why I like it so much. I'm very biased. Uh, but this has to do with everything to do with stars, it turns out. So let's talk about this binding energy per nucleon. What this is, remember the binding energy, it's the energy released when an atom is made from its constituent parts, which means when you make a new atom, this energy is the energy that's released. That's the binding energy. Now, of course, a larger atom, of course, has larger binding energy. So one way to sort of scale it is look at how what's the binding energy for every nucleon. Remember nucleons at the top number, the um, neutrons plus protons. So if we consider the binding energy per nucleon, that would be a graph of this on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we'd say the nucleon number. For example, the very first element is hydrogen, so that would be one, that would be here, and the next one would be helium, and so on. So you have to know the shape of this graph. Uh, maybe I'll draw it like this, maybe in sort of blue like this. So I would draw it like this. First of all, you have to know that it goes kind of up, and then has a peak and then kind of goes down like this. It turns out it actually goes, has a few little spikes there, but it, it suffices to go something like this. It goes kind of like this. It has a peak right here and you have to know this peak. You have to know that it's uh, iron, something like that. So there you go. So it's the iron, which is uh, the 26th element. You have to know it's iron 56. This is something really important to know. That's the peak here, that's the top. And then it goes kind of down again. So what happens here? Um, well, first of all, oh wait, if you don't know how to remember the shape of this graph, this is going to be really, really dumb, but watch this. Look, I always thought this looks kind of like a whale. So I always thought this is like, you know, the top of a whale here. I'm going to erase that because if I save this PDF, no one's ever going to understand that, okay? But if you want, think of a whale. And there you go, that's why I call this the whale here. So this binding energy per nucleon. Maybe that's really dumb, but hey, I'm teaching you how I remember things. So the important thing to know is this. Uh, first of all, reactions will occur naturally, which means in a star. Remember I said inside a star, for example, you've got hydrogen turning into helium. That's a natural process. Uh, but they'll happen naturally if they go up in the curve. They have to go up in binding energy per nucleon. So what that means, look carefully here. That means that if I'm looking at, oh, I don't know, something like uh, hydrogen here, and I want to go up on the curve, do you notice that means I have to go right? That means I have to go from a lighter thing to a heavier thing, and we call that fusion. So fusion is this act of going from a lighter element to a heavier element. So this explains why fusion is on the left, because it's more, it's more energetically favorable, you could say. Because only by this does it go up the curve, and by going up the curve, then it, you know, that's what it has to do to be natural. That's why fusion happens to the right, until it reaches binding energy maximum here, which is iron. At this point, you notice, even if it tries to fuse iron into the next thing, it doesn't go up in the curve. So it doesn't do it naturally. You have to force it to happen. So like I said, uh, here's the problem. Um, stars can't naturally fuse iron in their cores. Let's look at this one, though. So if uh, you have to go up uh, on this curve to have a naturally occurring uh, process, then that's why it goes up. That's why it goes to the right here. What about on this side? Like what if I had, I don't know, like uh, uranium. That's way over here somewhere, nucleon number. Right, that's like 238 maybe, they're like way over here. This one, in order for uranium to do something naturally, do you notice that to go up on the curve it has to go to the left? So that's why going left means you make lighter elements, don't you? We call that fission. So that's why fusion is on the left side and fission is on the right. So to go naturally occurring, you've got to go up on this curve. But just to explain it here, where it relates here, I think it's really interesting. You've got hydrogen to helium. Stars can form other things. When they run out of hydrogen in their core, they're going to do some weird things. They're going to collapse and expand, and weird things is going to happen. But the end result is, what if you have a really massive star, and it got all the way to iron? Imagine this. So you have a star with iron in its core, right at its very, very center. What's amazing about that is that, notice it can't go up anymore. It can't fuse anything higher. So what ends up happening is the mass of the star, the rest of the mass of the star, of course, it's very massive, right? It has a lot of gravity. So that means that's going to come inside and sort of collapse uh, because it can't push anymore. It's uh, related to something called hydrostatic equilibrium. You don't have to know that for this, for this topic here. But it, I think it's nice to know what happens is that 
uh, stars can't fuse anything higher than uh, iron. And we think that stars are actually responsible for making the elements. We call it nucleosynthesis. So the very fact that stars are making uh, new elements, what happens as soon as they get iron in their cores, though, they collapse. So actually, it turns out it's really kind of freaky, but like the iron that's in your blood, that is what wrecks the star. That's what makes the star actually not be stable anymore. Because it can go all the way up till iron in its core. If it has iron in its core, um, it's no longer able to fuse, so that means it's going to collapse. And it turns out it's going to collapse, and through some weird processes, it'll harden and explode into a supernova. But just so you know, I think it's really cool to know that stars can't make anything heavier than iron. Then they blow up. So the thing you need to blow up a star is actually in your veins, literally. As soon as a star has the iron in its core, it explodes. It doesn't quite, it actually implodes and bounces off a neutron core. But uh, Now you might wonder then, how in the world then are heavier elements made? You know, because if, if stars are the ones making all the elements, uh, which we think they are, other than hydrogen, we think the Big Bang made hydrogen, uh, we're actually pair production and this asymmetry between matter and antimatter. But um, if you look at this, uh, how are heavy elements, elements made? You could say, well, a star can make all the way up until iron. But then after iron, when it blows up, only when it explodes in this supernova explosion is when it has enough energy to then make those. So we actually think that all the elements higher than iron were actually made in the supernova explosion itself from a star. It's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it?